Welcome to Main Street Bellhaven. It's under several feet of water in some places and sinking fast. Hurricanes, tornadoes, ice storms, they're all natural disasters that we have no control over. But with a little preparation, we can minimize property damage and danger. For the next few minutes, we're going to talk about what to do when the lights go out. We'll talk about how to prepare as the storm approaches, what to do around your home, what items to stock up on, and what plans to make. We'll talk about what to do during the actual storm, and of course, we'll talk about what happens after the storm passes. By following the instructions in this program, you can minimize the risk to you and your family. The employees at your local utility want to make sure you come through a storm safe and sound. North Carolina is known for its hurricanes. Over the years, we've experienced the devastation they can cause both from winds and the flooding that often follows. Well, North Carolina ranks third in the U.S. in the number of landfalling storms uh, after Florida and Texas. And certainly in the last few years, we've seen a, a large number of hurricanes come ashore here in North Carolina, a real cluster of activity. Um, and it's been a while since we've seen this kind of activity in North Carolina. You have to go back to the 50s before you find a similar pattern with a lot of storms striking in the same area here in North Carolina within a short span of a few years. With today's changing climate, we don't always receive notice of approaching storms, but many times we do. Whether it's an approaching hurricane or a winter ice storm, many of the preparations are the same. By preparing properly, you can improve your chances of coming through the inclement weather safely. The severity of some storms require the need for evacuation from your home or business, so plan an evacuation route. It may be too late to leave at the last minute. Usually the local American Red Cross chapter can provide you with the safest evacuation routes available, as well as the directions to the nearest shelter. Thanks to modern detection and tracking devices, the National Weather Service can usually provide 12 to 24 hours of advanced warning for approaching storms. Advisories are issued by the Weather Service of the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, when hurricanes approach land. A hurricane watch is issued when a hurricane threatens a coastal area. Continue to listen to advisories in case that watch is upgraded to a warning or in case an evacuation order is given. A hurricane warning is issued when winds reach 74 miles per hour or higher. When we think about hurricanes and we watch them uh, brew up in the tropics, we of course immediately are drawn to the, the wind speeds. We, we're fascinated by these storms that can reach winds of over 150 miles per hour. And certainly when a, when a hurricane makes landfall with uh, winds say over 100 miles per hour, we can, we can really see some significant destruction, particularly in our coastal areas where the storms come ashore. Uh, in recent years though, we've noticed that the flooding has actually been the greatest problem uh, in uh, parts of North Carolina, particularly with Floyd, uh, with Fran as well. Uh, historically, storm surge has been the real threat on the coast where the sea level rises as the hurricane makes landfall. But we're noticing now that within the last uh, 20 years or so, most of the deaths that have occurred in the U.S. Uh, as a result of hurricanes have come from inland floods. Uh, when rivers swell from uh, heavy rains that are dumped by these storms, flooding creeks, um, washing out bridges and highways, and causing great destruction many, many miles from the ocean shore. If you plan to leave your home, unplug or turn off all appliances, but you'll want to leave your refrigerator and freezer plugged in and turn them to the coldest setting. They can maintain food preserving temperatures for up to two days after power has been lost. You need to prepare offices and commercial buildings for arriving storms. Cover all glass windows and doors, at least on the first floor, with shutters or paneling or some other protective material like plywood or masonite. Safeguard company records or make duplicates and secure them in a waterproof container in case the bank is flooded. Move important documents away from windows. Those items on the first floor should be placed on tables or otherwise raised off the floor in the event the first floor becomes flooded. Take before and after pictures of the business to aid insurance and or tax credit claims after the storm. Disconnect all electrical appliances and equipment. Things like typewriters, copiers, coffee makers, electric clocks, calculators. You want to prevent damage from a blown transformer or excessive surge when the power is restored. Check drains on the roof of the building to ensure that they're clear and able to drain off the heavy rain which usually accompanies a hurricane. Clogged roof drains can cause the roof to collapse from the weight of accumulated water or cause damage to the interior of the building if water on the roof becomes deep enough to cover vent pipes and run down inside the building. 
check storage yards for material that might be blown around, and secure objects which could be blown about by the force of hurricane winds. Boat owners should also take extra precautions. If the boat is at home, it may either be left on its trailer or be stored upside down along the side of the residence. If the boat is left on the trailer, water that collects inside of the hull may damage the trailer. Let out some of the air from the tires and block the wheels to prevent them from rolling. Anchor the boat using good, strong rope and allow protection for chafing. Canvas should either be removed or rolled tightly because the wind will get under it and generally rip it. All other items should be removed from the boat. Remember, leave early from low-lying areas that may be swept by high tides, storms, waves, or flooding. Well, back during the, dec the decade of the 1950s, North Carolina earned the, uh, the nickname of Hurricane Alley, uh, largely because of Hurricane Hazel, which was a Category 4 that came ashore down in Brunswick County. But uh, really a series of storms there, 53, 54, and 1955, uh, North Carolina was hammered. Uh, the very year after Hazel, in 1955, we were hit with three landfalling hurricanes within six weeks. Connie, Diane, and Ione all made landfall here in North Carolina. And the combination of those four storms in two years uh, brought unprecedented destruction to North Carolina. Be aware that some areas may flood long before the arrival of the storm. Your escape may be further complicated by the fact that the population of some high-density areas may require evacuation orders to be issued earlier than one day before the storm's arrival. Don't get caught by the storm in your car on an open road. If you're going to evacuate, make plans for your animals. Most pets are not allowed in shelters. You can either leave them with a friend or make arrangements for them at a boarding kennel or perhaps put them in an enclosed storage or utility room. If the pet will be left at home, leave plenty of food and water. Be sure to identify the pet with an ID tag if it doesn't have one. Plan it ahead with proper identification, proper records, vaccinations, medications, insulin, tranquilizers. Plan ahead is the key to uh, being prepared for your pets during a storm. The pets need to be identified either with permanent identification such as a tattoo or microchip or with a collar, with name, address, a relative's number where you'll be out of the storm area uh, so you can get reunited with your pet should you get separated. Animal shelters do not uh, allow dogs in, in the shelter, so you, uh, to, to, you have to plan ahead in, with a, a boarding kennel or a veterinarian. And all boarding facilities require proper vaccinations, current vaccinations of your pet. So you want to make sure you have documentation of your vaccination history, medical records, any medication that the animal is on, like insulin, tranquilizers. You need to plan ahead and make sure you have everything prepared for those times. Mm -hmm. Shelter in a barn or shed should be provided for larger animals such as horses or cows. Plenty of food and water should be provided to these animals inside the shelter. If a barn or shed is not available, research has shown that large animals are far better off in a large pasture with no overhead power lines and well away from areas that might generate wind-driven debris. Really the best thing to do is to go ahead and let them out and preferably in as big an open space as you can get them because if you've got limbs that are flying or whatever, they can hit the horses and stick in them just like you see them sticking in the ground. So as open a place as you can have it. I know a lot of people think that you would go ahead and put them inside the barn, but by nature they want to be outside. I mean, horses have a big, they're fearful of anything. So they feel better outside where they can run if they want to. And um, lots of times they don't get along, but during a storm, they pull together, they'll just stand beside one, right beside one another and turn their butts to the wind, whichever direction it's coming to protect each other. They stay together. Another reason um, that you would want to put them outside, in case you can't get to them for a few days or whatever, they have a food source. They have their pasture that they can eat uh, when you can't get to them for any number of reasons, whatever. Um, and that's a good thing to have. They can live for several days with just on their pasture food if they have to. Animals have superb survival instincts in open space. Large animals should also have some form of identification information attached. If you plan to stay home, you need to prepare ahead of time. If you or a loved one needs any life support equipment, you need to envision a worst case scenario. Assume that you may be without power for quite a while. You should have adequate battery power for the life support equipment or an emergency generator and enough fuel to operate it. If not, make plans for the family member to go to a shelter that can handle life support equipment. Even though you have notified your power company of the fact that you have life support equipment in your home, 
They may not be able to restore your power as quickly as you need or want. A person who has respiratory problems or is on oxygen therapy should not be alone during a storm. This person should be advised to have someone stay with them or check on them periodically. These people should be advised to stay calm. Emotional stress increases heart rate, quickens breathing, and makes breathing more difficult. That demands more oxygen from the body. A person with respiratory problems is advised to avoid the use of candles and lanterns. If they must be used, the candles, lanterns, and hurricane lamps should be kept at least 10 feet from the oxygen containers. Regardless of the kind of storm, you should have certain safety supplies on hand. A flashlight with extra batteries, a battery-powered portable radio, first aid supplies, non-perishable food and water, of course a can opener that doesn't require power, any medicines you might need, cash, credit cards, and a pair of sturdy shoes. Listen to your local emergency management office and follow their instructions. It's difficult, in some cases nearly impossible, to live in today's world without electricity. Your electric utility knows that. That's why they do everything possible to keep the lights on. And when there is an outage, they work as quickly as possible to restore power. But if you're considering a backup electricity generator, it's important that you follow all the installation procedures properly. If installed incorrectly, a generator can cause serious harm or even death. Here's what you need to know. This is a manual transfer switch also known as a double throw safety switch. For our application, we're going to call it a manual transfer switch. On opening the door to this manual switch, we'll find that there are three sets of lugs. The utility lugs are fed through the top. The load lugs, which in our application is the home, feed at the center. The bottom set of lugs are fed from the generator. The, set, the switch has three positions. In the center position, all of the loads, utility, home, and generator are completely isolated. No power is being fed at all. In the up position, the utility is now feeding the load, which is our home. In the down position, the generator is now feeding the center set of lugs which is feeding our home or load. Now the reason we want and must have a manual transfer switch or transfer switch in general for our application is for the safety of you, your home, and linemen working on the power lines. Without a disconnect switch of this sort between your generator and your home, you run the very grave risk of backfeeding the utility's power lines with your generator. Now what do I mean by backfeeding? Well, what happens is without this switch, you're feeding your generator into your main circuit breaker panel. That circuit breaker is then backfeeding through the main lug back to the utility's transformer up on the pole. Your generator is producing about 240 volts AC. When it gets to that transformer at the top of that pole, it's stepped up to about 7,200 volts, and that line that is supposedly dead by the utility worker's knowledge is now hot and poses a very grave risk. This manual or double throw safety switch alleviates that concern and causes you or the lineman no harm. A manual transfer switch needs to be installed by a licensed electrician. If you do not desire to put in a manual transfer switch for your electrical system, you may still use your generator by plugging your appliances directly into the receptacles on your portable generator set. Bear in mind the size of the generator and the loads being supplied. Do not overload your generator and use the proper size wires or conductors for the application. Many people choose not to hardwire their standby generator directly into their home's main circuit. Instead, they power select appliances with extension cords. If those appliances are at any distance from your generator, make sure you use a three-wired cord with a three-pronged plug, and of course, plug it into a three-hole receptacle. Generator sizes vary. Common units can be from 8 to 14 horsepower and capable of handling from 4,000 to 8,400 watts, including starting surge requirements. Prices may range from $800 to $3,000. Also remember to determine the wattage output you need before you buy a generator. Manufacturers rate the strength of a generator in terms of wattage. The generator's output wattage should meet or exceed the total wattage of the appliances you will operate in case of an outage. Never exceed the rated capacity of your generator. 
Overloading can cause serious damage to the generator or appliances. Before operating a generator, list all of the appliances that are going to operate at the same time. Then determine the starting and running wattage requirements. The starting load lasts only a few seconds, but is very important when figuring the total wattage you'll use. Your generator must be rated to handle the total wattage. Always follow the manufacturer's recommendations on how to use your generator. Call your electric utility if you have questions about sizing or using a standby generator. Home generators are usually powered by gasoline, which must be properly handled as well. Operate them only in a well-ventilated area. You've prepared for the storm and decided to stay put in your home or office. But now what? Remember safety first. Keep everyone inside away from windows and doors and if possible stay on the downwind side of your home. To prevent the possibility of flying glass you should have already shuttered or taped your windows and wedged any sliding glass doors. For added protection also remember to keep blinds and drapes closed. Turn off all the appliances except for lights in the refrigerator or freezer. This will reduce the chance of overloading circuits when the power is restored. Use your phone only for emergencies. Should you call the power company when the power goes out? Not if everyone else in the area is also without power. Your utility has people handling calls round the clock and monitoring outages in a variety of ways. You can be sure that if all the power is out in your neighborhood, we already know about it. If there are down lines or sparking lines around your yard, by all means call. You should assume that all down lines are live and stay away from them. After a hurricane, the public needs to be very aware of down power lines. Uh, even if the electricity is on in your community and area, any down power line could be energized. You need to stay clear and contact the local authorities, the co-op office, and with the location of the power line. After the storm, if your home is the only one without power in your neighborhood, contact your utility for service. Before calling, check all circuit breakers or fuses. When you call, be prepared to give the name the account is in and the physical location or address of the home or business. The power company's most immediate concerns are providing power to essential services such as emergency radios, local TV and radio stations, hospitals, utilities, public service facilities, and the transportation system. Crews will work to get all of the main distribution lines in service, then begin block by block restoring the lines that serve residential customers. Crews will work as long as it is safe regardless of the time of day until service is restored. Be patient. Each time a line crew member has to stop and answer questions about the restoration, it takes that much longer to restore your power. The public needs to understand that we have a systematic procedure for restoring power. Uh, we have to get the transmission lines up, the substations up, the distribution lines, and then the individual services. Uh, this does take a while. We just ask you to please be patient with us because we have the resources out there and the men are working as hard as they can. Sometimes the transmission lines outside the area are damaged. These lines supply power to one or more transmission substations. Tens of thousands of people could be served by one high voltage transmission line. During these times your utility will do everything possible to repair damage to the local system but may not be able to restore your power immediately. Local distribution substations serve thousands of customers. They're checked next. If a problem can be solved here, power can be restored to thousands of homes immediately. Main distribution supply lines are the next area of inspection. These supply lines carry electricity away from the substation to a group of consumers such as a town or housing development. The final supply lines, called tap lines, carry power to the utility poles or underground transformers located outside homes or other buildings. Line crews fix the remaining outages based on restoring service to the greatest number of customers. Once service is restored, every effort will be made to keep it on, but there may be interruptions as the utility makes further repairs. Your power company is responsible for damage of the overhead lines to the masthead of your electrical service. Any other damage will have to be repaired by an electrician many times before we can affect our repairs. The co-op is responsible for the service coming to the house and then the consumer's responsibility starts at the weatherhead connection. Uh, they're in charge of the responsibility of the weatherhead, the mask, and the internal wiring. And you need to get a licensed electrician to come to your home and fix it before we can re-energize your house. If you evacuated, listen to the radio and television for reports as to when it is safe to return to your home. Sometimes it's dangerous to return to an area where crews are trying to restore the power and repair damage from the storm. We ask your patience in these matters. 
You should get your information from the County Emergency Management Offices. The employees at the electric utility will not be able to let you know of damage or a time when you can return. Remember, safety first. If you smell gas or hear hissing or blowing, open a window and leave the building. You'll want to shut off the gas at the main valve and call your gas company from a neighbor's home. Remember, if you have to shut off the main valve, you'll need a professional to turn the gas back on. Check your electrical systems. If you see sparks or frayed wires, shut off the electricity at your main circuit breaker or switch box. If you need to step in water to get to that main circuit breaker or switch box, talk with your electrician first. If your home was flooded, look for any down wires. If there are any, do not proceed. They may still be energized. Instead, call your utility. When you return to your flooded home, unplug any electrical appliances, but do not attempt to replace any fuses or reset any circuit breakers until all of the water has receded. Do not stand in water. When you're ready to make your repairs, make sure you're wearing dry clothes and rubber-soled shoes and stand on something dry and non-conductive, like dry wooden furniture. Before re-plugging electrical appliances into wall sockets, be sure the appliances have been checked for water damage and all cords and other parts are dry. If after plugging in an appliance the breaker trips or fuse blows, or you see smoke or smell a burning odor, disconnect the appliance immediately and have it checked by a qualified appliance service person. Now, let's review what we've heard. Remember, safety first. It's never too soon to make a storm plan. 1. Plan an evacuation route. 2. When you leave your home, turn off or unplug all appliances with the exception of the refrigerator and freezer. 3. Cover windows and doors, at least on the first floor. Raise valuables off the floor. Document your belongings with photographs. 4. Secure boats and other outside items. 5. Make arrangements for your pets. 6. Plan for the worst. If a loved one is on life support equipment, make arrangements now. 7. Make sure you have safety supplies on hand. 8. If you have a standby generator, be sure it is installed properly. Notify your utility that you're using a portable generator. 9. When returning, be careful before entering your home. Check for signs of high water before turning appliances back on. Ten. Stay away from downed power lines and call your electric utility. Check for gas leaks. Remember, safety first. We here at your electric utility will do everything possible to restore your power as soon as possible after a storm. But we need your patience and your help. If you have any questions about anything you've seen in this program, please call us. We're here to serve you. Our job is to keep the lights on and to provide safe, reliable power.